Um, first of all, Hashim, thanks a lot for, for accepting the invitation and for finding uh, the time to come to Krishna. I know you're super, super busy. So, thanks from all, all the people from CAF, uh, from me, from Nori, from all the volunteers and, uh, and our host. Uh, Hashim Sarkis, uh, I don't know if you have any story from the people, I don't know if you GSD from the world. I have a good job in the DJU, so I have a Haitian program for transition. I have a lot of people who are architecture, and urban MIT. I have a program in my fort, in the program in my fort, in the architecture, in the Fikim. I have a lot of people who in the bibliothek, I have a lot of architectonic. I considered the blue 
shades of the skies to be uh, caused by the degree of humidity in the sky. But that later on this device was abandoned because it was very rough as a measurement and they understood that there were many other factors that contributed to the coloring of the sky, including aerosols. And so it, it was put aside. But I've always, since then, found this device to be a kind of epiphany, an overture towards possibilities of identity within a place. And how perverse is it that you can say, oh, in Pristina, it is shade 63, sorry, 53. In Beirut, it is shade 24. Ah, you live in the 24 zone rather than the 53 zone. But the fact that they exist in a spectrum together that describe the world in shades of blue, and the very gesture of turning to the sky to identify and measure the discerning attitudes and identity of a location could provide a much needed guidance about how we define identity in an increasingly globalizing world. How do we embrace even constructive differences, and I would insist on the construction of differences, without compromising the universal values that bind us, our identity as citizens of the world. Architecture, let's face it, is fated to transcend the contingencies of time and place, at least not in further notice. If it does not, then it is condemned to vulnerability. In my work as an architect, as academic, as Lebanese, and as a citizen of the world, I work hard towards this transcendence. I work within the material limitations of what is possible in order to produce wish images of what is not possible, at least not yet. I go after state-of-the-art technologies in order to build the kind of building that I want to suppress the technology, as if the technology is a marker of place, whereas architecture has to produce a timeless effect. In order to make architecture, I strongly believe we have to look away from the factors that make up architecture. We have no choice but to turn them around and turn our gaze towards the sky. And this is not a metaphorical term. The sky is a physical presence against which almost every architectural proposition is projected. I aspire to make buildings that look like von Humboldt's blues, buildings that clearly identify the location and culture, but that identify them as shades of universal identity, that binds us all together under what sky, no matter what blue it is. In 2011, we won a competition for the town hall of Biblos, Jibay. Biblos is a historic city, one of the oldest inhabited, continuously inhabited cities, and is a world heritage site. And this road takes you from Beirut to Tripoli, the highway. And they decided, for many reasons, I'll get to them, to build the town hall, the new town hall, on the interchange of the highway along the road. The competition was open, anonymous, and it was in black and white. I don't know if you do that here in Kosovo, but there's a very strong belief among the public university professors that final projects have to be in black and white because it equalizes the problems. The rich kids will not have more access to printing and to rendering techniques than the poor kids. Everybody is equal. And the jury of this competition were professors from across the, the universities in, in Lebanon, and they insisted on the black and white. The project was the one that we submitted, and we won was three blocks one for administration, one for the mayor and his team, and the third one was a polyphilic hall, which ultimately became a museum. And we presented them as three volumes floating over the wall that protects the side of the park from noise, but effectively allowing the park to continue underneath the building as a public space, no matter what's happening. What I will present today is how we went from a set of black and white drawings, representations, to a building that is in color and that is actually built. And what are the different challenges that we face, the choices that we make, in that space, 
and how many of those decisions come back to certain recurring themes that may add up to the psychometrics argument that I presented up front. This is because, and you can see this gaping hole over here was the old cap until the French of the 1920s decided that since Biblos is this archaeological treasure, we're going to clear it, move the people out, and turn it into an archaeological peak. Much of the pieces that are left belong to different historical eras, from Phoenician to Greek to Roman to uh, Arab to Crusade to Ottoman to the present. This clearing of the old city caused a, a major setback for the economy of the city, but Ultimately, much of the population moved around, and before they built the highway, there were much better connectivity between the old city and its suburbs. Uh, that infringed also on the agriculture and created a rather messy situation. The United Nations has declared this a World Heritage Site, and since then, and because of its scale, because of its manageability, and its proximity to Beirut, Bibros has grown to become the highest visited site, the most visited uh, tourist site of the level. And with the devolution of tax money, it has managed to create a very strong local economy and build a lot of partnerships with international agencies, uh, and has become a poster child of possibilities in them. And the competition for the town hall was seen as an exercise of transparency, and truly when we submitted our entry to the competition, we thought the cousin of the mayor is going to win or someone related to and when we won, we were quite surprised. We uh, went to an exhibition of the projects, and a young man came up to me and shook my hand and said, Congratulations, I, I participated in the competition, and I happen to be the cousin of the man. <laughs> <laughs> At which point we felt, Okay, there's hope there. You can see very graphically in the positioning of the site how it is located. Uh, this is it is located on the end of the old Roman axis, which was recently excavated, pointing to the Crusader Castle. Uh, these are the Phoenician settlements. And pointing straight up to the Mount Teleron, which is the mountain that was framed by the arch of Nimai from the park. Uh, a very impressive sequence. And the positioning of the site, even though it's arbitrarily around the uh, turnaround, is actually quite opportune because it locks together all of these different. And the site itself is extremely problematic. You do not position the town hall, which is a very heavy traffic building in the middle of a highway exchange. It creates a lot of traffic around it. In so and so, when we saw the brief of the competition, we wanted our boards to say, change the site and send it back. But ultimately, we accepted the conditions and we designed the building that was made out of three blocks. And from these three blocks, we thought that we can eminent, we can actually impact the larger setting. And indeed that happened, but with a series of accidents that are related to the politics of organizing the town, but also may have a lot to do with how, when you put a project in a site like this, you're forced to fix the city around it in order to make it work. Uh, this idea of a building that gets transposed in order to recalibrate the relationships around it is a strategy that we had to face before in the housing fishermen for the city of Tyre, which finished in the 19, sorry, it finished in 2008. It was a similar project, an old town that is what had to site non edificandi you had to move the fishermen out because they were locked in the old city with very unhygienic housing and building on top of each other. Uh, and they relocated into the agricultural fields outside the city. And what we did with that project was as a way of creating community, and even though the whole neighborhood around it was getting disaggregated into smaller blocks, we held on to the grain of the agriculture in the field and created a building that, in its geometry, not only captured that grain, held on to it while everything else broke down, but also used that as a way of locating this community at the larger scale back to this because of the scale of the development itself. Until today, you can see it. Actually, these were given to us by an archaeologist who did not know what this project was, but saw it as a very different uh, feature until he heard about the project and he sent it to me by 
by email, uh, how it maintains the scale of the agriculture while everything around it is beginning to break down. And that becomes the scale of the community which is recreated on the outskirts of the city as a compensation for that displacement. And many of the outdoor spaces, you can see the piercing connections to the mountains and to the sea uh, through these balconies that happen between the spaces as a way of relocating the balcony. A similar strategy was used, kind of geographic placement of a very localized project in the Beirut Landing Park in Beirut, which is a temporary installation, a clearing in the city as they were building up the new towers after the war. This has become a tower now by Herzog and Dumour. And there what we try to do is maintain the evidence as a way of capturing the voice that were created by the reconstruction. But that was also technically needed for the balloon to be able to operate. And instead of putting all of the facilities on the surface, we tuck them underneath so that this space is maintained as a large urban green for a brief period of time while the development begins to happen around it. I think a similar strategy Anna and I used in the Zorlu Central Competition in Istanbul, where instead of building it up as a city, we tried to reconstruct the hill in the landscape around the shopping area and use the towers, the residential and commercial towers, as a kind of barometer in the skyline of the city by breaking it down into a series of buildings but maintaining its continuity as it acts in the skyline. A similar a graphic strategy about how geography can actually be captured in the buildings is almost in the reverse in this case. This is an installation in Amman, Jordan, uh, at the entrance of the Design Week Hangar exhibition. The colonnade was designed by the curator, uh, Sahel Hayai, uh, excellent architect, who gave us the space and said, deal with it. And I've always been fascinated by the hills that vendors of watermelon create outside their shops to stack them up. And in this case, what we did is reconfigure the composition of the space the, by offsetting it and create a landscape out of watermelons so that you would walk between them when you entered into the space. And we collaborated with the vendors of watermelons to create seven stacks of watermelon because Amman, like many Roman cities, was built on seven hills. And uh, also to replicate something about the archaeological sites around it, which are the Rujum, which are burial grounds that were made out of big uh, megaliths that would be stacked up together. And so here is a kind of miniaturization of a larger landscape that architecture could possibly propose, if you can call watermelon a material for architecture. But back to Biblos, I think the geography is very much connected to the economy of here we have the sea as a tourist attraction, and initially a viable resource for the fishermen, now more. Uh, the archaeological sites around the old harbour, the Phoenician harbour, you can see the traces of the city hitting the walls of the Ottoman expansion, and you can see the Roman axis piercing through to the town hall. And you can see the sharp difference between the old city and the modern city. Rather hodgepodge, a train station, uh, a gas station here, uh, residential development there, a bank there, with banana plantations still in the middle. No coherence there, and in a way, there's a big burden on that building to pull everything together. Economically, the city has thrived. It's a viable tourist attraction along the waterfront, and there desperately trying to make every piece connect to the larger world. And what better title for a, a restaurant than the Hacienda de Pepe Jardin de Biblos Fishing Club. Okay. All languages mesh together to communicate to the world. And I think this meshing of languages, I will come back to at the end, as a, another possible expression of our global identity. But here they are trying to promote tourism, uh, religious tourism is thriving here, a Muslim woman, visiting a, a Romanesque Crusader church, and then uh, the Roman ruins next to the mosque. This kind of attempt to put all of the possible attractions together, including major uh, summer festival that happens actually happening now, uh, 
the gorillas gave their first unmatched concert there. Very important moment in music history. <laughs> and you can see the castles lit up at the skyline uh, behind. And they've revamped the old bazaar as a way of attracting the tourists when they come. And you know all too well the geopolitics and the wars around us that have somehow hindered the growth of tourism as an industry there. But people are waiting. And in this moment of waiting, they're playing soccer at the beach or volleyball. They are, there are hints of possibility that have not yet coagulated into some kind of uh, golden year that we've always imagined since the 1950s when we wanted the welfare state to turn Lebanon into this thriving uh, economy, industry, and kind of cosmopolitan center of the world. But the traces of this cosmopolitanism are everywhere. Most recently, they were expressed in the very active, young, relatively young uh, municipal team uh, headed by the young man in the middle who was not even 40, I guess. And Bibos has been lucky in having a succession of mayors that did not start everything all over again. And every time you have an election, they don't erase everything that the predecessor, predecessor does, but they build it, no matter what their politics are. And this team has taken over a kind of continuum and, take, and really exponentially taken it to a different level of uh, they, they've built parks, they've tried to uh, create pedestrian networks of the city, build an infrastructure, but all of these efforts have always been isolated, funded by international agencies and not brought coherently together. And the project of the municipality is a case in point. So when we proposed the project, the idea was simply to build a park underneath, to allow, to delay the entrance until that point where the traffic would slow down and you're not hindering either entrance or exit. But that proved to be too difficult, so we put the entrance at the bottom, and from there on we started figuring out how to improve the entrances of the city so that you reduce the traffic to this point. Initially started organizing the traffic differently to slow things down a little. But found ourselves with the mayor and his team looking at the hodgepodge of the city and helped them with a series of projects from a transportation plan to better land uses to identifying key public spaces, highway frontages, entrances, and town. So, in a way, we worked first to identify through the hierarchy of roads what would be the best ways to enter the city. First, we created this loop which exists, but try to heighten it as a way of holding the city together on both sides with two underpasses, identifying key parking sites, which are public parkings, but can become also public spaces for the city. We use the transportation system that is given for the city, for some French city, uh, as a donation for tourists to come to the festival and go during the summer, and we suggested that these become used all year round to reduce traffic as well, for free. And then we push the entrances out. This is still not implemented, but the idea of entering the city not just from those two points, but from two other points, which is critical to reduce the traffic, uh, in order for clarity of movement to be better and not to congest everything there. These are a bit difficult because they, are, they sit in the territory of other municipalities, smaller municipalities, so we're still working on and you see how that locks into the loop system and where the public spaces are. We're working very hard to convince them to leave the agriculture alone, but to introduce tourist resorts within the agriculture so that agro-tourism can, uh, can be a replacement for the large resorts. There's a series of old uh, train tracks and vehicular roads that we're trying to revive as pedestrian paths introducing a limited tram line along the old rail, and that seems to be moving quite well. And then uh, the old ravines that have dried up, reorganizing re them as pedestrian passages within the city. It's a big project of improving the highway facade and what to do in order to hide all the arguments on the highway. And most importantly, and this is the most recent project we're working on with them right now, is reclaiming the waterfront as a public promenade, as a boardwalk that connects all of the different activities of the city together over a stretch of two kilometers from 
river basin to river basin. That is happening right now. We just submitted the DOQ for this, and they're using it to raise funds. Uh, but what the waterfront does, which I think is similar to what the town hall does, is it locks together a series of very disparate elements within the city's activities, from agriculture to uh, beach resorts to uh, to the festival grounds, to the archaeological sites, in one continuous thread, and tries through ways of unifying them in certain material treatment, and it's a very light hand that we're using there, uh, to bring all of these different elements together. And I'll just give you this as a very simple example of a before and after, and that's what would be the, the introduction. That's it. But it's a very important stitching element. Uh, the hope is that all of these interventions will create a coherent framework which will pull the different efforts of the city together into one larger gestalt, which is desperately needs. But it's interesting that all of that emanated from an architectural intervention. Right now, this is completed. We've created a big public plaza there, a pedestrian bridge that extends the Roman axis is almost finished. I don't have pictures of it. But ultimately, uh, the idea is that this building floats over a continuous ground that put the geography of the city both in, in both directions together in a very clear way. It's trying to pull the city this way and across to the mountains. And you can see it here, uh, how it is, yeah, right there, and how it is situated in order to through its volumes, but also through the organization around it, uh, to bring clarity to this mess. Ultimately, the project is made out of three volumes, and it's very much an object. It's not trying to dissolve itself into the system. It holds on to its object character. And this is something that many of the projects in the office have. If we go back to Adrian's presentation of the ideal modernist complex as being an ensemble of object, object types, each with a very specific character of this machine produced, and that the urban space is produced out of the relationship between them. The urban experiences past that moment have proven to be very difficult to orchestrate, and therefore we work with isolated objects. And the skyline of Pristina is very similar to the skyline of Beirut in the fact that every building wants to take on more than it can, but ultimately the building next to it takes on a very different projects and they start clashing. In the end, if we can talk about these not as objectives, but perhaps as almost objects, objects that distort, that bend, in order to show what they're reacting to and maybe connect to the outside world, but they have to hold on to their objects. And in the work of Michel Serre, I found the definition of the notion of the quasi-object. And most of the projects in the office are like that. You can identify a figurative shape, but it's always slightly compromised in order to adjust, but not fully dissolve. Uh, Ser talks about the epitome quasi-object as the soccer ball. And he says that the soccer ball as a ball itself is a dumb object. We all know that it's not a dumb object. It has very specific geometry, it has very specific stitch to it, the leather quality is important, how you, how you turn out of pieces of uh, flat geometry, a circular shape, and how it has evolved over time. I mean, all of that is captured in that object. But he says that the varieties that the soccer ball has register a lot its use. It's the way it operates within the space of the field and its exchange. And it gains its value not for its autonomy, but because it's a quasi object, an object that is thrown into a network of social exchanges. From the individual player and how the individual player manipulates it. The Wispy Go where in Real Madrid shirt is not an accident, it's on purpose. <laughs> and then how that ball goes into the interior space of the inter, into a soccer and then into the outer space of the field, Bernabeu. Uh, 
is very important in order to produce that culture. And that culture is not simply about the game, it's about how the game is viewed, how people like me take alliances with the other league against Atletico. Where are the Atletico fans here? <laughs> uh, it becomes very important. And therefore the ball, as it sits there, is a dumb object. But when you throw it into this very large field of exchange, and how it acquires different values in that network, it becomes extremely important, but ultimately, it is a ball. And whereas Michel Serre, after him, Bruno Latour, and the whole actor network uh, theorists have been pushing for the object dissolving into the network, I'm pushing to hold the object back together. And thus, the notion of the quasi object, as I see it, is more about that ball and the impact that it has in orchestrating that space. The building, coming back to its organizational qualities inside, beyond being a series of distorted volumes that try to adjust to the views both of the mountain and the sea in order to capture as much light and view internally while protecting itself from the sun and the noise of the highway externally. Uh, so when you see it from outside, it's actually a series of blocks. You don't know what scale they have, but when you go inside, realize that it's very well connected to all the views. And actually from the mayor's office, which is right here, he has a direct view to the castle, uh, Crusader Castle of Water. Uh, beyond that, what it is, is a very simple organization. The ground floor is receptions, uh, information, you pay your uh, traffic bill there, you pay your taxes there, and there's a cafeteria, which with a, with a fork, a kind of terrace, stair that becomes a theater and it connects the park which exists to a plaza that then now connects with the bridge down back to the sea and the volumes are empty dumb boxes deliberately emptied out as much as possible cleared from structure i'll come back to the structure question later in order to allow for change internally and one of the biggest damnations of public buildings is how much change they do over time to them so in order not to had a fight with the, with the occupants, I left it empty. Uh, this emptiness is, I think, in itself a recurring theme in the work that we've been doing in the office. It's partly because of a desire on my part to engage architecture not as program, a series of sequestered spaces that have adjacencies and relationships of hierarchy, connectedness, etc., but as a form of inhabitation. How do we inhabit an empty room like this? In the morning you have the discussions there, in the afternoon it's a lecture, but it's actually a space of very specific proportions which is activated by virtue of the intensity of the edge and what happens outside, whereas the space itself is open for revision over the course of the day, over the course of the year. And that's a theme that has come to the work in the office by virtue of working with NGOs by virtue of working with clients that keep changing their mind uh, and frustratingly destroying everything that we think we're fixing. So I try to circumvent the program as much as I can. And that has led to a series of projects. This is the Agriculture Center of North Lebanon, which is a stone throw away from the project that Adrian showed. I have an aerial photograph that shows them together, I didn't bring it. But I would be driving past the fair every time I'd go there, and there are a few references to it. I'll show them in a second. Uh, this was an existing agriculture uh, food factory, dairy factory, that they wanted to expand into a technical school. And it included a daycare center, a restaurant, a gift shop, a dairy factory, a food processing area, and uh, some accounting offices. And all of them had to exist in that structure next to each other. And we did a series of studies of how they worked, but ultimately what organized it all and what is still there, even though the project is unfinished, there are many unfinished projects in there, uh, what holds it together are the series of courtyards and the outdoor spaces, which this was never meant to be for the kids to play in, but because of the proximity to the daycare, the daycare stood out into it. And uh, 
What we did was also organize it in relationship to the mountain, to Mount Lebanon, and so that those open spaces are not just about spillover from inside, but about the possibility of piercing through the building and seeing outside. This was inspired by the framing of the mountain in Nimai. <laughs> and you can see how it's elevated enough to be at the level of the canopy of the olive trees so that you can see forever. And I think this is something that you can achieve a lot in Pristina. At the hotel where we're staying, the minute you step up a little bit, you can see forever. Again, you're in my reference. Now you cannot see anywhere because of the total things. <laughs> uh, this was also applied as a strategy in an olive oil factory where we pushed all of the social activity, administrative activities to the perimeter, but it became also a way of control of the activity inside. Again, a project that is operational but unfinished. And that was also the strategy in the room. Pulling everything to the edges so that the interior remains empty. And what that does is it intensifies the edges so much that everything is there, structure, program, uh, mechanical support, and leaves the interior open for possibilities of interpretation. That strategy has become more of a design strategy for a series of houses, which is a complex we just finished north of Biblos, south of Tripoli, on the Mediterranean. Uh, a series of houses which we call the court towers because they're each a combination of a courtyard and a tower. Okay. Let me confess from now, all I do is design courtyards. All of the projects are courtyards. This is a, just a kind of catalog of them all. And uh, here, they're all encrusted in the hill. So the idea of a kind of typical courtyard is a little bit distorted. And the hill is not the natural hill, even though it looks like it. I made it look like that. I mean, just the, the topography is completely constructed in order to allow the houses to be staggered and to capture the views without blocking each other. But you can see here, the perimeter is taken to an extreme. Structure, the building spans 15 meters with no columns in the middle. Uh, circulation, mechanical, and the protection against the hillside of this kind of double wall with a walkway that allows all of that to be happening in the perimeter. And then there's a courtyard and a tower that work as a balance, but also for shading and for air ventilation, it, it works as well. You can see the kind of idealized square shot into the mountain, distorting a little bit with a tower popping up as a way of compensating. And then this idea of the perimeter is emphasized in the way you move around and in the way that much of the shutters are embedded in the thickness of the wall. The way the wall itself opens up to become the sinks on the top and the doorway on the side. And then how the whole space opens up, the cantilever corners to become a balcony. The bedrooms become big balconies on the outside. Uh, I want to show you this just to see how the sink pushes into the wall in order to create that added thickness. And these closets here are actually the air conditioning. So even in the thickness of the wall, we're using this. Uh, we're using seawater, bringing it in through a coil. And behind every one of these closets, uh, is again, the, sorry, I, behind every one of these closets, there's like a very thin radiator of cold water. It's a, called the gravity wall. The hot air comes in passively on the top, gets cooled and throws it to the top outside here. And in the winter it reverses, it becomes hot water and the reverse happens without any mechanized air going system. But all of that is kind of, again, the accentuation of the thickness against the space. And here is the living space, and you can see the thickness itself being over-exaggerated in expression by creating these dishes of colored stone that become like very big murals, almost exposing and kind of scooping the, the different thicknesses of the spaces. That's the bookshelf in the living room operating like that as well. And then around the swimming pool, that thickness itself exaggerated with the operations of the tiles. The main house, which is the common house for all of these houses, is a family of siblings. Uh, that have this common area operates in the reverse with the circulation happening on the perimeter on the outside and the room 
being in the middle. And that's the roofscape of the middle. This is just a tradition. And this we also use as a strategy for the design of a mosque, where, again, the very intensity of the act goes from a very solid pochet of the different activities to an undulating wall to the space of the, of the prayer. And it was at the time, this is a competition we did not win, but it was at the time when there was a whole debate about the minarets in Switzerland, when they forbade minarets. And the question here was, because it was a daily mosque, should we have a minaret or not? And so what we did is, in the thickness of the walls, we chopped up the corner, and the corner, while maintaining that same height as the rest, becomes a minaret, without being a minaret. So it's capturing it within the volume of the space. And that's the space of the interior. Now, with the courtyard idea, we've taken it to another scale. This is the Academy for the Al Khan Foundation on the outskirts of Damascus, which we finished the master plan just as the war started, so it stopped. But this is a kind of very short animation that shows how, again, the figure of the square gets broken up to a series of perimeters in order to house the different programs each around the courtyard, the weather there requires the moment, and then how it distorts and adjusts as a frame itself to capture the landscape while maintaining this intensity of edges and the openness of the interiors. Now with Bibos, this strategy is working but in section, in the sense that you can get these spaces between us courtyards hovering over the space underneath, and these spaces are on the outside, creating the possibilities of light, of uh, transparency, of connectedness to the outside world, but being suspended in the air. I've gone from very large scale to this idea of the building, to the planning of the building, as it says, with intentions, intense, intense edges and open interiors. Let me talk a little bit about structure. One would expect that moving from a highly tailor-made programmatic building's design to one where the structure or the frame absorbs everything and leaves the interior empty, two spaces that become challenging in terms of their structural dimensions. And where the building begins to operate almost like a sky, a sheltering sky, that in the thickness of its walls absorbs all of the junk and then leaves the space open for possibility. That would introduce in every architecture a big structural challenge. This is not true. The term structural expressionism was coined by uh, Iro Saidan, who in the kind of second modernism after the Second World War uh, discovered this challenge and talked about the possibility that instead of focusing on the uh, tailor-made solutions, we might have to just pull out and allow the architectural expression not to happen in the facade treatment and in the minutia of the response to the program, but in an overall structural level that carries the expressive dimension of architecture. And in this project, in Bibros, we tried very hard. We tried very hard to allow the structure to become the expression of the building. We worked, these are diagrams from uh, Adams Kara Taylor, Hanif Kara worked with us on this early on. First of all, the city budget was so low that we could not afford neither Hanif nor the structural solutions that they proposed, even though they were excellent. And they would have saved us a lot of headaches and would have taken this project to another level. But it was a delight to work with Hanif very briefly on this. And we then went on to propose a solution, which was a hung structure that would be a series of cores on one side and columns embedded in the noise barrier with a truss on the top where the whole building is hung to express the idea that it is floating. Uh, that proved to be not only expensive because the structural designers in Dublin over-designed everything, but it also was very difficult for them to maintain, to support from a, from a seismic perspective. Beirut is seismically challenged. So we abandoned that, and this was the kind of animation we presented to them about how this whole thing can work, hopefully to seduce them, but 
no matter what kind of graphics and options we use, the budget became too, too glaring and difficult. Han and I had worked also with Hanif on this competition in Istanbul for the uh, Zorlu Center, where because we wanted to pierce the towers with the passage underneath exactly where the course happened, uh, there was a need to suspend all the course. And uh, Hanif came to the rescue with a solution which I think is ingenious, where the tower structure opens up, creating a gap where people can walk underneath, and the whole structural load goes to those two lines that intensely go through all the way down to the foundations. Uh, and where we created a transition, of course. You can see the course suspended here over the passage, and people would arrive at this point and bridge out to this level while this passage continues to be a it was, it would have been a great solution, and we're hopefully going to use it in other projects. <laughs> but here again, you see kind of the core suspended as a structural expression of possibility. In, in this incomplete project, the uh, Agricultural Center for the North, we also attempted in the span of the ceilings over the outdoor courtyards to try and create a, a texture to that very large shelf in the sky. Uh, in order to make it less of a bland surface, but a surface that can register some of the structural character of the building. And in Lebanon, I think you do this here, they're built with hoarding blocks that are lined up and supported by rebar. You put formwork underneath, hoarding blocks, the rebars, and then you pour the concrete on top. Uh, this was an act of despair, because as they poured the first one, I realized how dull and ugly it was as kind of flat stuff. So working with the contractor, I said, can we play around with the formwork? And what we did is we lifted the holding blocks up by extra piece of wood. And then they poured the cement on top, level, so that you would get a crenellated ceiling on it. It's a very cheap articulation. And this is what you get. We painted it, sorry, let me go back. We painted it a very light paint, it showed in the other picture, I'm sorry, I don't have it here. But it allowed for two visual strategies to happen at the same time. The idea of the ceiling being this very large span gives a sense that you're outside. But the alignment of all these courtyards with each other this way creates a very strong horizontality, very panoramic view across this way. And that is thanks to the removal of many columns with this span. <coughs> this would have been the possibility of the balloon. We wanted this whole thing to be cantilevered, but it was a temporary structure and extremely expensive. And therefore we resorted to putting in pilotes. Ever since we put the pilotes, even though it was not a, my first choice, every time I see a pilotee, I think of a structure that cannot or should not be there. I mean, the pilotee as a kind of uh, placeholder for the possibility of no column at all, rather than being a column or a structural expression in of itself. Uh, They are in the way, and you have to accept the fact that they are in the way, they are not. As much as Mikko Bizet talked about the pilot as being a thing that the eye will slide around, uh, my eyes do not slide around. <laughs> <laughs> and so in Milos, ultimately we gave him. We could not design any of the other structures, but uh, a young structural designer stepped in to help. And he suggested that in the big mass, which is the Santa Eva, we could do without the we, can, we just have to thicken these, the, the beams. And with the other two boxes, all we have to do is plant two columns against the glass close enough that it doesn't disturb the openness and we will be okay. That was the solution we accepted and actually it works quite well. These are the columns planted at the edge and here they are on the interior with the exception of one of the entrances to the office building where the column is too present, the rest actually works quite well. This is the too present column. I'm showing you the ugly stuff, not the good stuff, not yet. <laughs> but this is it, in the lobby next to the entrance, it's, it's fine. <clears throat> when we submitted the competition, we wanted the blocks to look like scalars. That as you're driving on the highway, you don't know how big, how small they are until you get close enough to understand. The absence of windows, the absence of technology was very important. And, uh, 
I'm kind of in a megalithic state of mind these days, so that was a moment of saying, let's push that to the end. When you do a rhetoric like this, and you win a competition, you get stuck with it. <laughs> because the reason the mayor said, I like this project a lot, is because it used sandstone. And sandstone, according to him, was the uh, local national stone of the time, if there's such a thing. Now, we had to call it. And before we got into the argument about national stone, we said, okay, what color would this building be? You know from your coloring exercises as a child that color has absolutely no material characteristic connected to the thing behind it. You can do coloring like this. Right? The palette can be absolutely any color irrespective of anything. Many toy companies thrive on the fact that they miscolor things deliberately. And we have done this before. In the housing project for the Fisherman of Tyre, we use color desperately to hide mistakes, but also to create a level of grouping in the building that is neither the big building nor the small window, but something in between, a kind of creation of a scale in between that also allows the surfaces to step past each other and to create a hierarchy of sort among those groups. Also color the exterior as blues and the interior as yellows and reds with, the, with one set of colors pouring on the outside through the first one. This coloration we also used in another pavilion in uh, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, Vietnam, where we created a floating object and we wanted it to not only float this way but recede in there. And blue is a beautiful color in the way that it pushes things to the background, even if they are foreground. And so this volume not only hovers while maintaining the line of the street, but also pushes back, even though it is blue. There's another form of coloration that we have been experimenting. The housing for the fishermen was the first time I ever used color in any project. I've been trained to be white, uh, trained that chromophobia is okay, we're all chromophobes, either black or white, but nothing else. But when it came to finishing that project, and when we were thinking that it could be a white texture, the contractor came and said, Hashim, we don't have money. We only have money for a bucket of paint. And at that moment, I had seen how many mistakes there are in the capture of the plaster of the surface, and it was distorted, and the only way we could hide it was either with a, with a granular uh, finish or with stone. But then I realized that color could be another instrument. And when he told us, you can use color, white costs the same as blue or green, we went for color and we indulged. So, so had a kind of office therapy session where we dealt with the fact that we can use color. We talked about it forever, until today many people voted against me that I'd like to call it this. But whereas with cement, with plaster, it was more the parallel approach, I think with Pipros and with many other projects, we have been working with color more like this, where there's a certain material character that has to be expressed, has come, comes across. But the rest you sort of approximate and you adjust based on one hint or so we know in the coloration of black and white photographs that they can capture the texture of the skin and the color of the skin some, somehow. They know something about the suit, etc. But the rest they fill in. Right? It's, it becomes like a hint from the material itself rather than full palette. And therefore there's a kind of freedom range that you can exercise. And that's something we used in this facade where we try to exaggerate the pigment of the uh, aggregate in the cement and that's what we also used in the balloon color where we took the sand off the site, went to a pigment store said we want that pigment, it was very artificial color but we made it match the sand of the cut in the ground to make the whole thing look like a section and then we used that cement that we mixed to color the wood and we used the wood former to color the cement so there became a kind of material color exchange between wood and cement. Which, which expresses itself in this kind of detail. By the way, this is a close-up detail of that, of that moment because this is the only place where the wood and concrete align. 
That's where they don't want. <laughs> and the Biblos, they have been using the sandstorm everywhere. And they have insisted at a certain point, after we did many experiments with the color of the building, they said, sandstorm. And I hate sandstorm. Uh, for one, it's a color you cannot control. It stains. It uh, breaks apart. And it has been used in a very bad way in many of these facades along the Roman axis. It has been rusticated in these horrible treatments over here. And then, for a very bizarre reason, I don't know if you do that here in uh, Kosovo as well, they've discovered all the plaster ground faults to be made of sandstone underneath. And they've removed the, sandstone, the plaster and exposed the sandstone. Now, the reason you hide it is because it cannot last. It doesn't take humidity well. It crumbles. And it's not built to be exposed. And it turns these very beautiful cave spaces, which, are, which bring in a lot of light because of the plaster, into grottos, kind of prehistoric grottos. And this is a practice that is everywhere. They, they're plastering all the modern buildings with them. In some places, they try to trick it into becoming more like a better material by exaggerating the um, water between them so that the color differences are not that strong. But here they are, the kind of thrown between the buildings, applied to the old bazaar, applied to the, by the way, the older municipality. It was a temporary new old building, I mean, new built to look old. And you see these kinds of walls with the old city as well. And here it is lying everywhere. And they insisted that this is the stone of the city, but actually it's not the stone of the city, it's the stone behind the stone of the city. Only the stone of the old city was stolen to the buildings, which was limestone. And the stone that was exposed was the sandstone. And here it is crumbling in public display, but they are very proud of it. Initially we started pigmenting concrete and trying to create patterns that you can see them at different distances, opening up to views, but looking solid. Uh, but they insisted it has to be sandstone. And actually, one morning we woke up and there were four truckloads of sandstone dumped on the side. Which meant that we not only had to deal with sandstone, but we had to deal with that size of sandstone, which was about 60 by 30, I think. And we were stuck. At that time, I was in Verona buying stone for another project. And I ran into this very beautiful piece of yellow gravity. And I looked at it and I said, I wish sandstone could behave like that. And I looked at it again, and maybe sandstone could behave like that. We worked with the stone basins on site. We took this, pixelated it, not into the size of the stones that they have, but into smaller strips. The reason we broke it down into smaller strips is with the stone mason, we discovered that by cutting it into smaller strips, you can actually differentiate the color much more. Whereas a piece this big will have yellow to red, the likelihood that if you break it down, it will be much more differentiated. So we pixelated the travertino, broke it down into four colors, and then tried to copy some of its grains. We also applied it not just on one facade, but carried it across so that three blocks look like they're cut from the same block. And we worked to cut them into smaller pieces, and then piled them up into four colors. We sort of said, this is more yellow, this is more orange, this is more red. And this is how they came. Sorry, this is how they came, this is how they became. And then, with white paint, created areas of color, and there would be one mason on the scaffold, one mason behind, and they would adjust the colors so that it would look like a travertine machine. It wasn't exactly one-to-one -one pixel to pixel, but once we identified a couple of mistakes for them of the assembly, they got it and they did the whole thing in no time. And we only corrected the first facade two pixels. That's it. They were amazing. And it's all thanks to a Syrian team from Aleppo who were refugees in Beirut who helped us on this. Uh, one thing we tried to do is exaggerate the thinness. So that from a distance it can look like a clock, but when you come close up, you see how thin it is. This is uh, it's named after the Ottoman Emperor, I forget his name. Uh, but anyway, this is the Aleppo's stone mason, fantastic guy who helped us all the way through. And you can see the 
old stone, the cut stone, and the facade. And so, effectively, we went from this to this to this, and that's how we look at it. That's the opening last May. Last part I want to talk about a little bit is the idea of inscription. Uh, I realize I'm standing between you and three drinks, so I'll leave very quick. <laughs> uh, when we presented the building project, the idea was that the facades, which are these louvered facades, will continue on the belly of the building you know, to create some texture and continue with, and to strengthen the presence of those open courtyards. But we wanted to build it out of wood, and even though the mayor himself is a big wood dealer in Lebanon, a successful one, he refused. He refused, he said he doesn't want it to be an advertisement for his business, and he said, what will not last? Let's think of something else. Maybe I, I need another therapy session about this, but I always enjoyed writing on the things. Graffiti as a way of working on the things, but not carving it. This is the kind of detail we wanted to do on the housing for the fishermen before we abandoned it because it was expensive. The kind of stencil in the brush, uh, I forget what you call it in English. It's the it's machine that you use to spray uh, colored aggregate and then you can stencil it. So anyway, we were using that for the facades with alphabetic, Arabic alphabet for each block, each one having its block and then using them for the screens themselves. And even in the side facades, the colors were meant to create something like an odd hieroglyph that would be juxtaposed against the actual Arabic letters. In the balloon project, we used the pattern of the chevron to create signage, arrows pointing one way or the other, but also we brought asphalt on the interior, it's almost like a tarmac of an airport, and drawn on it like a white on a tarmac, with the idea that architecture is not the language that dominates all other forms of expression, but is the host for the other forms of expression. So that we can move away from this obsessive control that parametricism and other tendencies today are insisting on, that architecture does everything at every scale, to architecture becoming more hospitable to other forms of expression, including language, as a way of connecting and communicating to the world. You see the chevron on the exit door becomes an exit sign, on the entrance it's reversed to become an entrance sign. Very simple graphics. And this is another project where the idea of architecture's form as a form of inscription into the landscape is, uh, is experimented with. This is a house, very close to a house that Han designed uh, and built. This is under, in, on the Aegean coast near Izmir, where we tried not to touch any of the trees by leaving the house between them and in doing that, creating a form of calligraphy there. And even this facade of the library, again unbuilt, was a way of trying to include two forms of writing, a kind of cloudy way and the scratching into the same surface. And what is beautiful about inscription, not writing, is that somehow a hand from outside pushes, but the material and tectonic character pushes back. And in that play, you understand the architectural surface as being less about something determined by the billboard applied to it on the outside or strictly by the material quality, but as a space of interaction between them. And that's a game that I like to play. Uh, and in the Biblos case, because Biblos is the birth of the Phoenician alphabet, the first phonetic alphabet in the world that the Phoenicians then gave to the Greeks, and then it became the basis of all phonetic alphabets. They turned the third volume into a museum of the alphabet. And we thought, well, maybe the facade itself as a screen can take the barcode type, which has become a prevalent one, and literally say Biblos in it, so that when you're passing by the highway and you zap your phone, it tells you Biblos. And we used that code as a way of creating a screen, bending it around to connect to the other side. Now, here again we were faced with color. What color to use? Initially, we accepted the sandstone 
and we needed to find the color for the aluminum. I think I was going through one of the fashion magazines that we have at home, and I found the Dries van Noten collection of that year with very beautiful ochres and blues. And blue was going to be a very dangerous color to use here, given the sea and the mountain, but we borrowed his Prussian blue. And, you know, Dries van Noten, the fashion is the, one of the Antwerp's extract, is that, yeah? Uh, uses blues very well. And if, you, if you want to borrow a color palette, I would go to him. And here we just pose the ochres with the Prussian blue. And the Prussian blue proved to be a very good color because it's very dark, it's almost like a black mirror that ultimately is colorless. And we just pose it with black and fade the curtain wall. It's not a curtain wall, but it looks like a curtain wall uh, with the continuity of that color. And that's the mayor's office on the interior. That's the way it looks on a clear day. And that's when it's shaded, it actually works perfectly well. And that's the space between and the degree of reflection that it introduces in the space. But what I want to conclude with, perhaps, is more. Uh, idea, starting with that expression of identity within a globalizing world, and what could be the possible space of architecture to communicate, is that architecture could also be a place of convergences of languages of expression, not just a hegemony of one identity or one way of communicating. And that the availability of services that it provides, the hospitality that architecture has to offer, by creating public spaces, by bringing people together, allows its services also to be possibly spaces of expression for different people. And in this case, we just pose the barcode language against a Phoenician text that we turned into a mural along the noise barrier from the inside. And you see the juxtaposition of those different expression types, abstracted enough that they can begin to share the same surface. French Philosopher Jacques Rancière talks about design as creating a surface for exchanges among different forms of expression. And in a way, we, I would like to think of architecture as at once being abstract enough to communicate to the whole world, but rich enough in different forms of communication that it also creates that kind of surface of exchange. Whether between the blues, the mullions of the glass, and the textures of the languages that are used, including the Arabic used in Kufic to dedicate the building against the barcode, against the stone.
Can I confess that Pedros is an easy problem compared to Beirut, compared to Tripoli, compared to all of this? And that it is just at that moment where it could fail, meaning the mayor can give in to the pressures of waterfront development, uh, towers, etc. And that is showing some possibility. But it could also go the other way. And I have a feeling that the accumulation of environmental protection agencies coming to Beirut, uh, the World Heritage Site, the festival, UNESCO is playing a very big role, uh, are holding them back. And I think the economy that they're seeing of agriculture, tourism especially, needing control over land use is proving to be vital for everybody, including the land developers. And, but still, there could be a few monsters who want a very quick buck, a small piece of land that will destroy them. That's right. And it's, 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 you see it everywhere. I think places like Shuni, down below, Beirut, are gone uh, because of that. But Biblos is a, a sign of hope, possibly. And obviously, the scale helps. Like, uh, as the problem was of the highway trade, too much 
some of you try to use that sound in some kind of way. Does that make any sense? No, but I will use it next time. That's a very good idea. Uh, no, I, I, I have not been very oral in my architecture. Maybe Nimai as well. But, but that's for pointing it out. Actually, the highway noise has been always a problem for people. So we, if you saw the pictures when it's executed now, it's, it, the barrier stops on the Italy. We just finished extending into the north and it has created amazing uh, silence compared to the south, which is still open. And by having proven it on the north, they're able to extend it on the south now to allow for that amphitheater to work much better. But it's all about stopping noise rather than using it creatively like you're saying. Thank you. 